Hi, everybody. This is Mr. Folly, and welcome to almost the first day of March. So I hope you enjoy the uh, marching, running cadences of uh, who knows where this is from. So hopefully uh, you're enjoying this, and we'll learn how to titrate in a regular army method. Um, equivalence point versus end point. Graphs of strong versus weak. Graphs with multiple H's and OH's. Um, indicators are weak, acids or bases. And methyl orange and phenolphthalein methyl orange is what we're going to use for ASA yet. And phenolphthalein is what we're going to use if we're pH is in a base. Um, indicators for types of titrations, which are these two. And indicators change color within two pH units. So pick one near the equivalence point for that. So let's hop right into that. So titrations. So very few of you have looked at the uh, titration lab, the online lab that's on there already. Um, titration is determined the concentration um, or strength of something. It's probably not going to be the strength. It's going to determine the concentration of something. Um, you can use it to determine the molar mass and the equivalence point and the end point. The equivalence point is where uh, moles of acid equals moles of base. And it looks like this is what a titration thing looks like in here. Um, the end point is where the color changes. Now, ideally, um, where moles of acid equal moles of base and the color change, those two in our perfect world are the same. And they should be, they won't be exactly the same, but they'll be very close. So how do these things determine molar mass? So most commonly, we do concentration, which is XMV equals XMV. And remember, we've got our acids and bases and all those things. Now. If I wanted to find the molar mass of something, remember molarity equals moles over liters, and moles equals mass over molar mass. So that would mean that molarity equals mass over molar mass over liters over one, right? Which would be mass over molar mass liters, okay? So instead of an M here, um, you get that same type of the deal right over here. So we're looking at our moles, right? So molarity times volume that we go through the same type of dealy deal. So we take this guy, drop it in here, and you can solve for the molar mass of something. So our ways to solve for molar mass now are with a titration, which is fairly rare, but possible. Titration. Um, the gas thing with the uh, flame on here, the volatile liquid. Oh, and I'm doing this off the top, and I can't remember. Uh, which is a PV equals nRT, or PV equals mass RT over molar mass. And I'm drawing a blank on the other ones that we know how to do, which isn't good. So, hmm. Well, that would be a good thing to put on there. So, sorry. I'm going to pause it and think. Okay, it only took me a second. The other one would be delta T equals I times K times mass RT over molar mass. And then there's one other one in Chapter 17, which is electrochemistry going through. Procedure. By the way, you can titrate a solid, often KHP. Um, K means it's going to be soluble. I don't believe in K. And H, there's your little acid H. Right? Um, the goal is to have moles equals moles. That would be equivalence. And titrations take off every H or OH and look for doubling, such as H2SO4. The final rinse in the burette is the substance you will be using in the burette. So don't rinse something with water, because then you're going to be watering it down. Oops, and not in the burette. Go until you have a persistent color change. So sometimes you have a flash of color. Say we're using um, phenolphthalein, it'll be pink, and then the pink goes away. The persistent color change means it turns pale pink, and that pale pink stays. Adding water to the beaker does nothing because there's no change in the moles. Um, water in the burette dilutes and changes the concentration of the burette. Okay. So here is a list of what the strong acid bases. Don't you love the higher resolution? You can actually read these things. So on this one, we're going to start with a low pH and end with a high pH, and we have only one hump. Okay. So this would be. Um, strong acid titrated with strong base. So the titrated thing is what you're titrated with strong base. So this means the base would be in the burette. Weak acid titrated with strong base here means the strong base would be in the burette. Notice um, it starts at a medium 
acidic pH. Notice how it's higher, right? And this curve right here is more gentle. This change right here occurs over, I'm going to make up a number, 6 pH units, which is a lot. This change right here occurs over 2 pH units, which isn't quite as much. Notice if I've got a strong and a weak, again, I have a gentle curve. And then this one, a weak acid and a weak base, is a very gentle curve. And I hope you can see that these things could be inverted as well, where I could have one that starts this way and goes that way. And you should be able to tell what they are based upon where they start. This one is a strong acid because a pH of 1 comes from a strong acid. This one is not 1, so it would be a weak acid. This one is not 1, so it is a weak acid. Okay. This ends just a little bit above 7, and that is um, a weak base. This ends a little bit above 7, that's a weak base. This ends 13-ish, strong base, ends 13-ish, strong base. Now, the point of equivalence, where one eats the other, is the point of inflection. Okay, the point of inflection is where it goes, this is concave up, this is concave down, and that's where that happens. It does not have to happen at 7, and it often does not. Okay? This one looks like it's close. This one, I wish I could get rid of it. But if this is a weak acid and a strong base, it should be above 7. This has a thing above 7. You need to know those. What if it has multiple H's or OH's? What would happen is you would have multiple humps, right? So, um, although those humps aren't exactly the best humps, so you would have one point of inflection that would level off and the next one. And the first one should be a steeper one because it is a stronger acid, and this one should be the gentlest one because it is a weaker acid that's going through it, okay? This is bad humps, okay? So you would have that. This would show that there are two H's or, you know, whatever it is. Um, two of those that go through it. So this would start out, looking at this, this would be a H2, so a diprotic, right? If my pH of 1 is right here and uh, 14 is up here. This would be a diprotic because the two humps, um, weak acid. With a what? Well, I'm ending up very close to 13, 14 with a strong base. That's it. All right. Indicators. There are a bunch of different indicators, but I just want you to know methyl red, if you have to come up with one, or phenolphthalein. And litmus will never use. Okay. So if your pH is going to be a little bit at equivalent, it's going to be a little bit acidic, that means this would be strong acid and a weak base. Phenolphthalein would be a strong base and a weak acid. And if you have a strong acid and a strong base, any indicator is fine because pH range is huge. And that's it. Okay. Color change occurs within two pH units. Choose an indicator that will change color near the equivalence point. So on these guys right here, see how this would come through? We'll learn how to calculate the equivalence point, um, the pH of equivalence, next time. Next unit. Ooh, we're almost done. From acid and base problems. Okay, so here we've got to get all kinds of ready for these guys, okay? When NaOH is added to a solution of hydrochloric acid in a 1 to 1 mole ratio, the resulting pH is 7. That makes sense. Strong base, strong acid. If NaOH is added to a solution of hydrofluoric acid in a 1 to 1 mole ratio, will the resulting pH be 7? No. Explain your reasoning. Because when I have, you know, Na is going to do nothing, right? So I'm going to have Na positive plus OH negative plus H positive plus F negative. Oops. Plus H2O. Okay, Na and F will not form. Right, because that's soluble. So I don't believe in sodium. <laughs> Spectator eye on land. These two guys, they're titrating it, so you're going to get H2O. And this guy, F negative, not that he has to react with a different water, but still, it helps sometimes. Plus, it's going to take one of these H's, HF plus OH negative. So when that happens, I end up generating some OH negative, which means my pH will be basic, and pH will be greater than 7. 
okay? Because the conjugate, um, so the F negative, is going to react with water and make a base. That wasn't so bad. Suppose you have an acid-base indicator that is represented by the formula HA. Assume that the molecule is a weak acid with a Ka equals 2E negative 9. So if it's Ka is 2E negative 9, that means its pH change would be 8 through 10. Assume that this particular indicator has a blue and yellow forms. HA is the yellow form, while A negative is the blue form. So HA, this would be the acidic part, right? Because there's a lot of H's. A lot of H's means you're going to see HA. Very acidic form is going to be yellow. So the pH change is going to be 8 to 10. The acidic form is going to be yellow. And the A negative form is going to be blue. At what pH will a solution of the indicator be exactly green? And by exactly green, I mean there will be equal quantities of the blue and yellow molecules in the solution. So that would be, ooh, somebody borrowed my calculator, um, negative log 2E, uh, negative 9. So whatever that is. So whatever negative log 2E, negative 9 is. So that would be 8 point something. Right. Now, the thing is, is, when it says exactly green, the issue with exactly green is, let me pause this to get my calculator. The issue with exactly green is that um, colors are hard to tell apart, especially for some people like me and some people like Mr. Stormont. Um, it really does um, change your ability to see when those colors happen. Typically, you need a change of two uh, you've got to have a hundred times difference in concentration to see it. So it's eight point something, but I do have my calculator now. Morning Glory is a popular flowering vine whose flowers open each morning and close each evening. When a Morning Glory flower opens, the flower petals change color from purplish red to sky blue. Oh, I don't believe in either one of those colors. I think it's either red or blue. Is it possible that this color change results from a natural acid base indicator present in flower petals? So, hmm. All right, so acid base indicator. So that means there's got to be something acidic or basic in the environment. Uh, okay, so things that are acid basey in the environment would be CO2. Okay, now morning, right? Uh, natural acid base indicator present in flower petals. So whose flower open each morning and close each evening? So CO2. Does the CO2 level change? from morning to evening. Um, I'm going to assume they asked this question, meaning that the answer would be yes. Okay. Now, those of you in biology that learned plants are green and don't run around, you might have also learned that um, plants breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out O2. Um, so if there's a time when they are taking in more carbon dioxide, that would reduce the amount of carbon dioxide available in the environment. Or, with a high CO2 level, that would be when it's taking it in. Remember, there's a light and dark reaction. 